can be assured I'll never be invited to be the speaker, the imam in a Muslim mosque. But if they made that mistake, I could talk to them about Elijah because the people of Islam believe in Elijah. I'm pretty confident I'll never be asked by a rabbi to be his guest, to speak from his uh, platform, to speak to the Jewish people. But they believe in Elijah. Now, it might be that I would be invited to speak to some people about Elijah that would call themselves Christians. But you see, we sometimes take these stories and we preachers preach about them, but then we preachers are sort of looking like, where's the flowers? I've, I've invested the work, I've, I've watered, I've removed the obstacles and the hindrances of weeds, I've tried to make sure that the nutrients are there, and I'm not talking about groceries, I'm talking about the spiritual food, so that the, the people that say that they love God begin to reproduce I mean, those were zinnias, in case you didn't know. And so I didn't go out there and expect to get blueberries off the zinnia. I'm, I'm not that naive. I expected to get zinnia blossoms. They, they're, they're delicate. In fact, I think these are dwarfs. They're just such tiny little reproductions of what God is able to do. So I want to challenge you this morning. You say, well, I, I believe the Bible. Well, if so, there ought to be some fruit, there ought to be some beauty, there ought to be some change, there ought to be some growth. Uh, Right now, the nights are cooling off, and that suggests that not every season or day is is beneficial to uh, a plant. Uh, We've had cloudy days, and, uh, you know, plants need sunshine, and sometimes, in in fact, I I will tell you, I, I think if I could choose, I would be a blue sky Christian. He leads me beside blue sky Christian. I don't like clouds. Uh, I like the still waters. I like the green grass. In fact, sometimes I begin to think about myself as being so significant. I wrote this this week. I thought it was so profound. I was proud of me writing this down that I, I think of myself sometimes as the only pea in the pod. Yes. Colonel on the cob. Yes. Pebble on the shore. I must really be special. We'll read together about Elijah, and I want to remind you what Elijah said to the people of Israel. He said, if, if Baal be Baal, then follow him, and if the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob be God, then follow him. Let me tell you a bit about Baal, and then we'll read the Scripture together. I may tell you a couple other things before we read the Bible. But the worship of Baal was expressed through three things I want to tell you about. One was child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. Are we not a nation that sacrifices our children today? Would you not agree with me that there's no difference between those kind of people and us kind of people that for the sake of a, a, a violation of a woman's body that she could do what she wants with her own life? Are we not sacrificing generation after generation after generation? I should think so. So the people that worship Baal, and remember, we're talking about now the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who had a king, his name was Ahab, and he had a woman or a wife named Jezebel. So he loved her dearly, and he introduced the expression of Baal worship into the house of faith. And so I guess you could suggest that if the government really believes that uh, that's a a legal practice, it must, the government would never suggest anything to us that would cause injury or harm to its good citizens. But not only was it it the sacrifice of children, and I'll not dwell here long, but Baal was the, the god of weather and fertility. So I will be careful how I describe this. But uh, let's just say it like this, that the worshipers of Baal had relationships with men and women who were not their husbands and wives. So it would be like if I planted the zinnias that the bakers gave me, and I thought, well, if I really want them to grow, I need to go find a woman who's not my wife and have relations with her, and that would make the fields grow. I don't think that's exactly what the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob meant when he said he would be your God. And so the, the believers were worshiping Baal. They, they, were, they were what you would call pantheists or syncretism. syncretism. I'm not even going to try and spell it. 
basically what they were saying is that the environment was more important than God. And are we not like that as a nation today? I mean, that's why I put my fingers in my ears and refuse to watch so much of the television. And I am not surprised what comes out of Washington or Salem having to do with global warming and carbon footprints and all of these things. Let me tell you that the, uh, the, the worshipers of Baal, they were worried about their environment. And how long ago were they around? About 2,500 years. The environment's still the environment, isn't it? I mean, have we messed it up? Absolutely. The Bible says this, that this world groans not because we burn carbon fuel. It does not groan because we burn carbon fuel. It burns under the travail. Do you know what travail is? When I was 16 years old, my sister-in-law gave birth to uh, my niece, and I was old enough to go to the hospital. And I drove myself to the hospital. I wanted to see this new creature, this little baby, and I, I went to the maternity ward and Well, I got off the elevator, and as soon as the doors closed behind me, what I discovered was I wasn't on the right floor. I wasn't on the place where the babies were already delivered. I was in the delivery area, and I heard a woman. I wondered what they were doing to her. She screamed, screamed. I mean screamed. I thought the the, the hospital is there to help you, and she she was travailing. She was travailing, okay? I don't know what it's like to travail like that. I, uh, but anyway, uh, the, the world, our world, your and my world, groans under the travail of our sin. So let's read this text together. And uh, I don't know that I'm going to have fun with it because it's not funny, but it's different. Chapter 19, verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel. So the king told the queen everything that Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with a sword. So the king, he's in charge, right? He's the head of the kingdom, the king. He, he, is, he, he is above all, and he goes home and he tells his wife, the lady that he loves, the lady that is the joy of his day, he tells her what, how his day at work was. Do you have a good day at work, hon? Yeah. How'd it go? Well, this, this hairy, belted man showed up, and at the end of the day, he killed with a sword all of your priests. Now, I could launch off here and spend a good while today preaching about living with the wrong kind of woman. And if you want to know what I might have to say about that, go read the book of Proverbs and then come and talk with me about what I might have said about living with the wrong kind of woman. You'll see in a moment what I'm talking about. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, May the gods punish me and do severely if I don't take your life like the one of them by this time tomorrow. She made a promise. She promised that she would do to Elijah what Elijah had done to the prophets of Baal. Uh, Circle verse 3 in your Bible. You ought to know where that is. It says, Elijah became afraid. Now, wait a second. Well, I'll read and then we'll talk together. Elijah became afraid and immediately he ran for his life. What was he afraid of? He wasn't afraid of the king. He wasn't afraid of the 450 prophets of Baal. He was afraid of Jezebel. Okay? That's my understanding. And when he came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, in other words, he was in the northern kingdom, and he, he moved himself south. He left his servant there, but he went on a day's journey into the wilderness, and he sat down under a broom tree. That's where brooms come from. If you didn't know, you know, Walmart puts an order into the Middle East, and they go out and they pick brooms. That's not true either. And he prayed that he might die. And he said, Lord, I've had enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my father's. Then he lay down and he slept under the broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and the angel told him, get up and eat. And he looked and there at his head was a loaf of bread baked over hot stones and a jug of water. And so he ate and he drank and he lay down again. The angel of the Lord returned a second time and touched him. He said, get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. So he got up. And he ate and he drank. And then on the strength of that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. He entered a cave and spent the night there. I think the man that we see in chapter 18 is a man of prayer. 
He, he talked to God regularly, and God told him, go tell the government, go tell Ahab, that until God speaks through his prophet, it's not going to rain. And it did not rain for three and a half years. Would you not agree that Elijah was a man of prayer? Not only was he a man of prayer, he was a man of power. I mean, how is it outnumbered 450 to 1, 450 prophets of Baal to one man? He demonstrated a power to stand there and watch them do what this translation of the Bible refers to as a lame dance. And no fire fell from the heavens from Baal. It came from God and consumed the offering. He was a, he was a, a man of triumph. We'll talk about triumph motorcycle. Remind me if I forget to talk about triumph here in a moment. He was a man of maturity. He, he was willing to deliver the, the news, even though it wasn't necessarily good news. Can you imagine if, if uh, in this day and time, God impressed upon the heart of a believer to go tell the, the, the president of the United States, until God says so, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. Do you think the government today would pay any attention to that kind of man? I doubt so. That's not a comment about who's in the White House. I'm not being political here. I'm simply saying, in this day, God sent a messenger to the government. Today, we expect the government to send messages to us. And I would suggest that Elijah was a man of money. Much bravery. Bravery. He said to the people this truth. He said kind of like what, uh, who was it? Was it Joshua that said it like this? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We believe in God. Elijah stood over there and he said, Why do you stand between two opinions? Either Baal is your God or God is God. That takes a lot of bravery to say that. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, I find this this brave, triumphal man all of a sudden fearful. He's fearful. The Bible says that about him. Uh, One scholar said this as I was studying this week. The best of men are men at best. Suggesting we need the divine God. He was fearful and he was frail. I think he was foolish. I think he looked at the situation and and the circumstances instead of the Creator. I think he was foolish. But we could also agree, I think, at this point, he was fatigued. I don't know how his work week had gone, but it seems pretty dramatic. But just to get a sense of what is actually happening in chapter 19, we won't take long. But it says in in uh, chapter 18, we say that uh, Elijah, Elijah told his told his servant, go, go look, go look towards the west. And it says, Elijah bent himself over. He put his face in his knees. So you might even say Elijah was flexible. Have you tried to put your face in your lap lately? He was fle- seven times, and he would say to the, to, the, to the servant, go look, go look, go look. And finally the servant came back, and what did he see? He saw a cloud. Not, not, not a big cloud, not a thunderstorm. When he saw it, it was a, it was a cloud about the size of, of a hand. I mean, perceive that on a, on, a, on a cloudless day, just, just one cloud. And the Bible tells us in chapter 18 that uh, God told Elijah to, to get up and, and begin to run. And, and God gave Elijah such a strength that he outran, he ran in front of Ahab's chariot. You see, God even cared about Ahab. He told Ahab through Elijah, get down off the mountain. The storm's coming. You need to go home. Where did God take Elijah? Well, he took him to a unique place in Jewish history. He took him to Mount Horeb, H-O-R-E-B. Do you remember when, maybe you don't, Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt? Do you know where they camped for a year while they were trying to figure out who God is and what their life should look like? It was that same mountain. God has a way of bringing us back to uh, significant places, landmarks, if you would, where, where He doesn't change and He wants us to align our lives and our understanding so that we get back to where He is and He will speak to us as individuals. But I want to I talk with you about uh, Elijah and his uh, triumph for just a moment. I think I ought to start a motorcycle gang in, in honor of Elijah. He had a triumph. Uh, most gangsters ride Harleys, I'm told, but he had a triumph, a triumphal day with the Lord. And this is what I'd call my motorcycle gang, the suicidal saints. 
Doesn't that sound good? I mean, it sounds like we don't care what happens to us. We're willing to live out uh, whatever God has for us. Except Elijah wasn't that bold in the moment, was he? So uh, maybe, maybe, maybe suicidal saints isn't such a good thing. But let me tell you this. I, I see God bringing Elijah to the end of himself. Have you ever reached that point? Where, where, where there is nothing more that you can do, nothing more that you can give, nothing more that you can say, unless God gives you breath of life, you will cease to exist. How long can you hold your breath? Have you, have you ever tried that? Have you ever tried, I mean, today, not now, because some of you might get lightheaded and then we'd have to stop the service. But go try and hold your breath. Just go try. And see if you can hold it long enough that life leaves your body. You won't have the chance to come back and tell me how it worked for you. But I can promise you this. God has hardwired within you and I the absolute strength or desire, the hope of mind and the presence that we would not die, that we would live. Otherwise, we wouldn't spend $21,000 for each treatment on a human life. We spend so much of our resources and our time and energy, and that's good, and I'm glad it's there. But you see, God cares more about the soul than He does this body. We need to align our thinking so that we're not joining a motorcycle group riding around on the triumph expressing that we're the suicidal saints. I could, I could spend some time trying to psychoanalyze Elijah. Maybe, maybe he was expecting too much of others. And let me tell you this. I think what Elijah will discover or did discover is the same thing that you and I discover. If we expect too much of others, they will at some point disappoint us. Is that true? I mean, mothers, fathers, grandparents... People people are a disappointment. So why are we so surprised when people disappoint us? It's because we're not putting on the mind of Christ and thinking about people in the way that God thinks about them. Or, let me ask you this. If God be God, are, are you not at times a disappointment to God? I know I am. And what do I have to do? Well, I, I don't have to confess Him as my Savior. I have to confess... Well, it is confessing again. Not to become my Savior, but I have to confess my sin and in that sense be restored in a relationship that was broken because I disappointed God. So, if we're not careful, we put all of our expectations on other people and then we're disappointed. But I also want to tell you, if I were psychoanalyzing Elijah, I would tell you that... Uh, we need to be careful to not be like Elijah because he might have been expecting too much of himself. In fact, the Bible says it like this. Pride goes before a fall. The Bible says be careful that you don't think too much of yourself. Now, I got that from Elijah. Yeah. Because Elijah had seen God do mighty things and instead of celebrating that God had moved mightily and demonstrated that he was God over Baal. What did Elijah do? Well, I got a message from one woman. Just, it, it only took one woman's message to change his mind and to bring fear into his heart. I want you to see a couple things with me. I want you to look back at Elijah and realize that God had brought him to that place so that Elijah would be able to know that God was still God and that Elijah's life belonged to God and not himself. Let's talk about that for a minute. To whom does your life belong? Well, one way that you might answer that question, what people make demands on you? All of our lists are going to be different, but all of us have certain demands. And demand might be too strong a word, but what are people asking of you, expecting you to be the one that does those things? What do people expect or demand from you? And you think that your job is to meet every expectation. Well, that's a big word. Let's narrow it down to 
N-E-E-D. Some people have tremendous needs. Newborn babies have tremendous needs. I, I told a Sunday school class, I, I read this uh, recently and I really liked it. A mother was asked why she was taking her small child to church. She was explaining to her friend why I would take my infant to church. And she said, because here at home I have the power to change diapers. But the Lord who I love has called me to go to church because I change diapers and he changes hearts. We need to begin to refocus who is the most important person. And oftentimes what we're guilty of is giving in to the demands of others. And I want you to hear this ever so carefully to the distraction that you're so busy doing good. Now, now think about this. You're so active doing good that you don't have time for God. That could happen. That seems to be what, what is my understanding of who Elisha is and what's happened to him. He, he was exhausted. Was it fair for him to be exhausted? I should think so. Walk back the distance that he ran. I'm not exactly sure what the total miles is, but he outran a chariot. Just saying that makes me tired and short of breath. And he had gone a, a season or a time uh, without some food. Otherwise, why would God be feeding him like this? Evidently, what Elijah had forgotten was that he was, uh, I like to describe us as animated dust balls. Isn't that how God made Adam? He just scooped some dust up. He blew the breath of life in, and all of a sudden, a pile of dirt, a pile of dirt became man. Unless you ladies sit back and think, well, that isn't the way God made me. No, you're right. He took a rib. Okay, a rib, a bony extra rib, and he made you. Pastor, do you believe that? I surely do. I surely do. Why? Because we in our humanity are absolutely dirty, filthy creatures. If we were not so, we wouldn't sacrifice infants. If we were not so, uh, that three-letter word that I'll spell backwards, X-E-S, wouldn't be such a problem in every culture. And if it were not so, we wouldn't be such a fearful nation that uh, the smoke out of the exhaust pipe is going to affect the welfare of humanity, and we small, frail creatures have the power to save God's creation by riding a bicycle, not eating GMOs, because we are trying to fit in and please other people. I want you to look back in here. It says, Elijah ran for his life. He ran for his life. Three things that Elisha had done, and I would take from the time that he was strong. But what did Elisha share with the people? You are to give what you know. Give what you know. What do you know about Jesus? Jesus. I think if I were to ask Lucy, who was up here a few minutes ago, her eyes would brighten and, and they would sparkle. She has that. And, and she would be anticipating, what do you want to hear, Pastor? And she, would, she might not have a full and complete theological explanation of who Jesus is. But God made that little girl to love. And she would be able to agree with me that we are to love Jesus Do you know that? Do, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you understand that it, it's like those little zinnias? They, they, they gave just the littlest tiny blossom. Give what you know. There, my job is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. When somebody says, you are really a nice person, say back to them, thank you for recognizing who God is in my life. Don't just take the credit and say, yes, I really am a nice person because honest to God, none of us are good. The Bible tells me so. So give what you have. I'm getting mixed up in my point, so I'll let you sort them out. Tell what you know. Give what you have, tell what you know. What did, what did Elijah have to give that helped God be God with the prophets of Baal? Did he bring matches? No. Did he, did he log the wood and for the fire? I don't think so. What did he bring? Faith. He brought himself. He was there. He was willing to be outnumbered 450 to 1. That doesn't sound like particularly good odds. But he stood until a mean-mouthed woman got after him. 
Give what you have and tell what you know. I've, I've, I've messed those up a little bit, but the last one is do what you can. Do what you can. Do what you can. I uh, read a small newspaper article years ago about one of my great-grandfathers. He was a very tall man, I don't know, 6'5", and uh, he was really, really thin, just tall, thin, had a big, pronounced Adam's apple, and he had what my grandmother called a shock of hair. His hair was really thick, and it just stood up like that. It didn't matter how they cut it. Do you remember Brill Cream? Some of you are old enough to know what I'm talking about. We, would, we men today would call it product. Brill cream or Vaseline, all it did to my great-grandfather's hair was make it shiny. There was no product that would cause his hair to lay down. And he wasn't a terribly great provider for my grandmother. He wasn't a great father to uh, his children. He really wasn't. But I read a small article that uh, helped me understand what kind of a man he really was. He didn't swim well. In fact, he hardly swam at all. I mean, he just lived in a day and in time. He'd been born in England, and from what I'm told over there, the water's pretty cold for swimming, so probably the largest volume of water he'd ever put his body in was a, a bathtub, probably a number three wash tub. So he didn't have a lot of experience swimming. But the article said one day, a sunny day, there were two farm boys out in the country and they'd gotten in distress. They had a small boat and they were out on a pond or a lake and somehow the boat had capsized and my great-grandfather, Lee Owen, heard their cry for help and the article says, without regard to himself, he entered into the water and somehow a man who could barely, if not swim at all, was able to redeem the two souls that were perishing. When I read that, it was after my grandfather had passed away. And I thought, what, what difference would that have made if I knew that about him? And then I realized I wasn't asking myself the right question. My question was, because I have a grandfather like that, who did for others what they could not do for themselves without regard to himself, not what kind of a man was he, but what kind of a man should I be because I have a great-grandfather that was like that. So I went to the store and I bought myself a big medallion that said, my great-grandfather is a lifesaver. No, I didn't do that. What did I do? I asked God, God, what should I do with the story that makes me, me? You see, you'll never be Elijah, but you need to understand that your life doesn't belong to you. Your life belongs to God. And He has a plan for your life. So, I'm going to go back and read these and say, so give what you have. Do you remember the widow that Elijah was sent to? What did she have? A little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. What was she going to do? She was going to eat it and die. But what did she do in response to what God said? She gave it. And what happened? Never ran out of oil, never ran out of flour. Oh, you reminded me already, aren't you? Then her son drew ill and died. Remember that? And so what did Elijah say to her? Well, it must be sin in your life. You're a, you're a Canaanite woman. No. What did he ask her to do? Give her to, give, give the child, give the son to me. As, as symbolic of, a, uh, your children don't belong to you. My children didn't belong to me. When I began to become aware that I could do things for them, but God was God to them, I realized they were on loan to me. And my goal, my heart's desire was to make them. No, I can't make them. I can change your diapers, but I can't change their heart. But give them that opportunity to low and to love and to serve God so that when it comes time for them to give, they give what they have, they tell what they know, and I didn't write this one down, but do what you can. Elijah, James chapter 5, verse 17 says, He was a man like you and I, tempted in every fashion, but he was also... A man who prayed and things happened. He prayed and things happened. And you might say, I, I might have made fun of you. Wednesday, we gathered with the men, the young men of the church, and I said, it tickles my fancy. I, I don't let it always show, but if you tell me, oh, pastor, 
I drove around the block seven times praying God would give me a parking space. And God answered that prayer. I, I'm sorry if that's the most critical thing that God has ever done for you. You have missed out on who God is. God does miracles. What's a miracle? Oh, it's the throw. No. It's the home. No. It's not the parking space. The miracle is that God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, I'll slow down, Irene, I'm sorry, would not perish, would not perish, would not perish. What do you have to give away but the good news? To whom would God have you to say, I'm saved. I'm gloriously delivered from what I was to what he wants. That's the gospel. Notice the parallels. How long did Jesus go without food? Mark chapter 4, 40 days. How long did Elijah go without food? 40 days. Was God trying to persuade the people of that generation that he's God? Another way to ask it as we close. What's God done lately to persuade you that he's God? Don't be like Elijah and say, I'm going to lay myself down and, Lord, take my life. Unless you mean, Lord, take my life and use it for your glory, but not, Lord, take my life that I'm not here anymore. Heavenly Father, as we wrestle with who you are, and what you're doing in the world today, let us, let us confess, Lord, at times the American people are no different than the followers of Baal, the sacrifice of children, the immorality that we uh, wink at, and the pantheism that all of a sudden we see God in everything and you are not the, the singular, wonderful, unique God who is God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Forgive us, Lord, for when we are at our best, at best, we are men. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together as we sing our hymn of appeal.